Some 40 years ago, a group of relative unknowns headed by then newbie director Toby Hooper convened in the city of Austin and battled with the extreme Texan summer heat, a shoestring budget and some rather unsavory working conditions to make one of the most important horror films of all time, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. As controversial as it was praised, the movie has helped shape the horror genre, and although it's been succeeded by some rather subpar sequels, its legacy from its gritty pared-down approach to its iconic villain Leatherface lives on today. With that in mind, I'm Ash from What Culture, and these are 10 mind-blowing facts about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 10. It's not actually as gory as you think. For a movie that features the words Chainsaw and Massacre prominently in its title, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has a surprisingly low kill count of just five, or six if you count that poor armadillo row kill during the opening scenes. Of those victims, only one met their maker at the hands of a chainsaw, and it happens in the dark, so what gore there may be isn't all that visible anyway, barring the odd splatter of blood. The remaining few are dispatched by a variety of other means, sledgehammer to the head, being hung by a meat hook and frozen in the freezer, and getting run over by a truck. And they're death scenes are relatively tame. The reason for the lack of gore? As hard as it is to believe, Hooper wanted his film to be awarded a PG rating so it could be seen by as wide an audience as possible, and accordingly kept the on-screen bloodshed to a minimum. 9. It was Christmas shopping, strangely enough, that inspired Toby Hooper to make the movie. Funnily enough, the lightbulb moment for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre came to Hooper whilst he was out shopping during the Christmas rush in late 1972, at a department store where he happened upon a rack of chainsaws while strolling around the hardware section. Growing increasingly frustrated by the overzealous Christmas shoppers around him, Hooper said to himself, I know a way I could get through this crowd really quickly. That is, presumably, by mowing the mindless consumer hoard down with a chainsaw or two. Can we really blame him? 8. Edwin Neal compared the harrowing shoot to his time in Vietnam. Veteran Edwin Neal, who played the hitchhiker and fought during the war in the late 1960s, said the filming of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was worse than his stint in Vietnam. And that's really saying something. Shot over the course of four weeks during a hotter-than-hell Texan heatwave, the cast were forced to wear the same blood-splattered costumes throughout production, which, as you can imagine, much like a games workshop store, didn't smell too nice by the time filming finally wrapped. In fact, Gunnar Hansen's Leatherface costume started to reek so much that the cast and crew refused to sit next next to him at lunch. Bless him. 7. It was a particularly harrowing experience for star Marilyn Burns. Poor Marilyn Burns, who played Final Girl Sally, didn't exactly have the easiest time whilst filming. Beyond the gruelling heat and having to wear a costume so caked in blood that it was practically rigid by the time the shoot wrapped, Burns was injured several times on set. After her on-screen brother Franklin is killed and Sally escapes through some rather gnarly undergrowth while being chased by a chainsaw-wielding leather face, Burns was cut by branches several times, but that was nothing compared to what she endured during the movie's infamous dinner scene. While Sally's finger is being cut so Grandpa Sawyer can feed off her blood, a prop kept malfunctioning so a frustrated Gunnar Hansen cut Burns' finger for real. That terror on Burns' face during the dinner scene is absolutely genuine. 6. The infamous dinner scene took a day to film. Speaking of that dinner scene, after Grandpa Sawyer actor John Duggan realised how laborious the process of getting his old man makeup applied was, he refused to do it again and insisted the scene was shot in one go, which meant the minutes-long scene actually took over 24 hours to film completely. Thanks to the heat wave and a lack of air conditioning, the smell of rotting food and body odour in the Sawyer family dining room apparently got so intense and stomach-churning that cast and crew would take turns running to the window to vomit their guts up and catch a few gulps of fresh Share. 5. It's connected to the mob after the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was complete, Hooper struggled to find a distributor for his then shockingly violent movie before salvation came in the form of Bryanston Pictures, who secured distribution rights. Unfortunately for Hooper and everybody else involved in the film, Bryanston Pictures was actually a front for the mafia run by members of the Colombo crime family, who shafted Hooper and company by claiming the film only made one million at the box office, when in reality its profits were upwards of the 12 million mark. It wasn't until Bryanston Pictures went bankrupt and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was reacquired by New Line Cinema in 1983 that the cast and crew saw any real profit from the movie. 4. It was a marijuana fueled massacre Considering it was filmed during the 1970s, it's probably not too surprising that there was a little pot on the set of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What is surprising is that they waited until the last day of filming to chow down on a few space cakes and that it was Child of God Gunnar Hansen's first time indulging in the devil's lettuce. It turned out that wasn't Hansen's brightest idea when he found himself 
himself shooting a scene in which he had to chainsaw through a door whilst under the influence and feeling rather dizzy. Luckily, no one got hurt. Incidentally, the narrator claims he didn't see a paycheck for his troubles, but was paid the princely sum of one marijuana cigarette. Can't complain too much, eh? 3. The Leatherface costume was a liability Scary as the many faces of Leatherface are, one rather unfortunate consequence of having to wear masks throughout filming was that Gunnar Hansen's visibility was somewhat limited. Add to the fact that the already very tall Hansen was wearing 3-inch heels to make him look even more intimidating and you have a recipe for disaster. In fact, during the shooting of one scene when Leatherface is running through a doorway, Hansen actually got knocked out after hitting his head on the doorframe. Not exactly the most ideal working conditions for an actor that spent the majority of his time wielding a heavy chainsaw, really. 2. Realism was key when it came to the props. Alongside the titular massacring chainsaw, there were plenty of props taken from very real sources. That skeleton we see suspended in the corner of the room during the film's dinner scene? That was a real skeleton that once resided inside a real living human being. Apparently back then it was far more economical to purchase a human skeleton than it was an anatomically correct fake one. Art director Robert A. Burns also scoured the surrounding countryside sourcing real animal corpses, including eight cows, three goats, a cat, two dogs, two deer, one chicken, and that unfortunate armadillo, to give the set an authentic ambience. You can imagine how those genuine animal carcasses fared in the Texas heat. 1. Even the soundtrack was authentic Barring a few country songs they'd secured permission to use, Hooper and sound technician Wayne Bell constructed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre soundtrack from a range of DIY sound effects meant to recreate the noises a soon-to-be-slaughtered animal would hear in a slaughterhouse. The techniques Hooper and Bell reportedly used to create the movie soundtrack included scraping a pitchfork along a table, banging metal objects off things, and practically torturing a dulcimer. And, of course, there's that unmistakable roar of a chainsaw star. Starting up. So if you've ever wondered what it was like to work in an abattoir, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre soundtrack is a good place to start. YouTube. The Unexpected Frontier. These are the videos of WhatCulture.com. It's continuing mission to list strange new facts, seek out news and offbeat discoveries, to boldly go where no What Culture channel has gone before. Hey! How would you guys like to start a Star Trek channel? Hell yeah! No, sorry, how's he got a uniform? I've been asking for one Who for months is now. Spiding money, I've been sipping jippers on the beach somewhere. Hell yeah! Is he even cold? Hell yeah! If I had money, I'd be sipping jippers on the beach somewhere. Literally months, I've been asking for one for months. Hell yeah! If I had money, I'd be sipping jippers on the beach somewhere. Hell yeah! If I had money, I'd be sipping jippers on the beach somewhere. Hell yeah! If I had money, I'd be sipping jippers on the beach somewhere. Hell yeah! I'm Marcus, Marcus Bronzy, new presenter for Trek Culture. What culture's new home for all things Star Trek related. Now we've already got a bunch of great content like Adam Cleary's ups and downs for every new episode of Picard. And we'll of course have all of the lists and rankings that you know and love us for. Fancy yourself a Trekkie and want to contribute? Well, What Culture is hiring video editors and writers. So if you want to get involved, fire over a CV and cover letter to trekculture at whatculture.com. And while you're at it, don't forget to slap subscribe and give us a follow on Twitter. It would be a great dishonor if you didn't. I've been Captain Marcus Bronzy. Until next time, kapla!